today, yeah, um, as part of our coverage of the uh, recent advances in surgery, uh, we have a faculty lecture today. Uh, the topic is uh, management of renal stones. This will be delivered by uh, Professor Dibangshu Swarkas, who is Professor of Eural Surgery at IPGM and SSKM Hospital. So uh, after the presentation, if there are any questions, put in the chat box, we'll discuss. Uh, Dr. Dibangshu Swarkas, please, uh, you can share your screen and uh, start presenting. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Is it visible? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay. Uh, good morning, my respected teachers and uh, students. Uh, so I'll be discussing on the management of urinary stone disease. And on this, uh, there'll be a case scenario and the case discussion will be based on this because this is a scenario in which you'll be uh, facing the patients in emergency or your OPD. This is an index patient. The 43 years old male patient attends here with history of loin to groin pain and low grade fever for three days. He's a known diabetic for last 10 years. He gives history of chronic diarrhea for which being evaluated elsewhere and under a gastroenterologist. He gives history of passage of urinary stones thrice before. When he was examined, it revealed a stable vital, there is mild flank tenderness. In the emergency, USD shows a right lower polar Calicial stone disease with a left hydroeurotronephrosis without any visible urotary calcula, but there was left sided hydroeurotronephrosis and patient was on the left side. And there was a right sided renal stone lower calicial. TLC is increased, uh, creatine is 1.3 on the borderline. Urine showed plenty of parcels. So, this is the typical case scenario we'll be facing, and based on this history, clinical examination, and the UAG and blood parameters. We need to manage these patients. Okay. So I'll be discussing on the classification of stones, clinical features, radiology, treatment algorithm, how to decide how to uh, uh, treat the patients, treatment of renal stones, erotic stone, bladder stones, and ultimately you'll go to the metabolic evaluation and how to prevent any recurrence in recurrent stone formers. So there will be the broad surveillance. So uh, basically, it's not a disease of the Pediatric patients, it occurs after 20 years, mostly between 40 to 60 years. Many patients are familial and it has a more predisposition for male patients, diabetic patients and obese patients. So you need to know the classification according to etiology. So there are mainly two types of stones. One is infections, infection stones, that is non-infection stones and the two minor varieties, genetic stones. These are recurrent stone formers with multiple family members who has been already uh, affected. There are few patients, drug stones like Indianavir, which is normally used in HIV patients. Okay, so uh, broadly, these are non-infection stones, calcium stones, either it can be calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, or uric acid stone. This forms the main bulk of the uh, stone disease. And the second group is infection stones. We see many patients who has recurrent UTIs or any abnormalities like PUJ or calicial diverticulum where there's urine stasis leading to recurrent UTIs or upper tract infections, which leads to stone formation. In this group, you can have a magnesium ammonium phosphate or carbonate apatite or ammonia muted. These are typical infection stones. Genetic stones, although rare, these are very important because unless you know the family history and the treatment of these patients and evaluation, the patient will have recurrent stones without any remedy. These are the cysteine stones and xanthine stones. So next is the chemical composition and their common names. These are the all calcium stones, calcium monohydrate, dihydrate, calcium phosphate, calcium hydroxide phosphate. These are infection stone, calcium apatite, calcium hydrogen phosphate. And these are the common names. You need to remember these things for exam purpose. Okay other calcium carbonate. This is truvite is mainly asked in exam. What is the composition? And you need to remember this also. Sometimes this is asked in the exam. These two calcium, uh, these two and this truvites are asked in the exam. Otherwise, you may not remember. Okay. So when you treat a patient with stone disease, you need to know the what are the other diseases which can uh, risk the patient for recurrent stone formation. 
the most and foremost important thing is hyperparathyroidism due to any reasons in surgery also you might be having a parathyroid adenoma and uh, leading to hyperparathyroidism some patients will have particularly ckd patients chronic kidney disease patients will have a secondary hyperparathyroidism okay so these patients will have hypercalcemia and recurrent episodes of stone episodes okay one uh, thing is nephrocalcinosis or medullary spons kidney or uh, one disease is sarcoidosis which leads to cal recurrent calcium stone formation and in surgery you will get some many patients who who has history of this jejunal ileal bypass intestinal dissection crohn's disease malabsorption syndrome urinary diversion these patients will have some absorptum absorption uh, of calcium and oxalate from the intestine leading to this disturbance of homeostasis of calcium uh, metabolism and excretion leading to recurrent stone formation so when you take a history of a patient even if it is a first time stone former you should check history of all these things otherwise you will be missing recurrent stone formers etiology and these are rare but not uh, not seen not like that this is cystinuria primary hyperoxemia renal tubular acidosis is quite common particularly in pediatric patients if you see a pediatric patients think of some abnormality because stone disease occurs after 20 years normally so if you see a pediatric patients or a history you think of this genetically determined stone formation and take a detailed family history okay and the last thing when, uh, when you treat a patient is the if is there any anatomical abnormalities which is predisposing the patient for stone formation whether the patient has epiphyseal obstruction or the patient has diverticulum any uterus stricture the patient has reflux the patient is in horseshoe kidney leading to hydronephrosis patient having erythrocele all these patients either leads to stasis or leads to recurrent uti or there is a pocket like diverticulum which predisposes these patients to stone formation so uh you need to address this issue because i'll come later this has an implication in the management also so like this patient uh when the patient comes to the emergency you need to diagnose uh there is a typical history of loin pain sometimes loin to groin pain sometimes a dull ache sometimes there is associated vomiting sometimes if there is infective pathology fever some patients will have some voiding problems also particularly lower uretic stones this patients might be having a strangury some patient who has a bladder stone will present with hematuria frequency urgency intermittency sometimes if it is lodged in the prostatic urethra it might cause any acute urinary retention also one thing typical of uretic colic is as the stone passes from the kidney or upj to the uj to the bladder the site of the pain radiation typically changes so from the history also you can judge the patient is having an upper uretic stone or mid uretic stone all lower uretic stone even if the patient is having a strangury you suspect that patient might be having a stone lost at the uj that is important because based on this you look for the x-ray also some patients may be asymptomatic just this patient who had bilateral stones one on the uretic stone on the left side and the right side he had a renal stone which was asymptomatic you are symptomatic from the left sided stone so you take a detailed medical history and try to exclude causative factors uh do a physical examination try to rule out sepsis in the form of tachycardia in the form of any flank tenderness or flank swelling next comes the imaging and biochemical test so uh what are the imaging studies we have we have ultrasonography we have kv radiography or x ray kv either contrast or non contrast c uh, kv ct scan and i view the thing is uh, in our uh, student days we used to do uh, x ray kv first followed by ultrasonography because ct was not available at that time but nowadays because the sensitivity of the x ray and the uhg is minimum if you have any doubt the patient is having the obstructed stone or the patient is in sepsis the first investigation in the emergency setting should be a ct okay so 
what do you see in ultrasonography? This is a picture you can see here. This is a brightly echogenic structure. And what is more important is the posterior acoustic shadow. Sometimes you'll get patient who has a angiomyelitima of the kidney, which has the same typical bright echogenic structure in the kidney, but what it does not have is a posterior acoustic shadow. So when you suspect a stone disease and find a structure like this, always look for this posterior acoustic shadow. Otherwise you question whether this is a stone or something else or fatty structure. As you see, the sensitivity is 78 percent, the specificity is very less, 31 percent. So, why do you do a USG? Because USG is an extension of the uh, clinical examination. And if you find a stone, fine. If you do not find the stone, but if you find a hydroteronephrosis just like this patient without any stone, you suspect the patient might be having something lowered down in the ureter. Okay. So, another. Uh, the fallacy of limitation of ultrasonography is it is very prone for missing the mid erotic stones. It's difficult to localize, particularly if the patient is not properly prepared or the patient is obese. Okay. Extra QB, uh, you need to know what percentage of stones, 80% of stones are radio opaque, 20% stones are radiolucent. So if you Clinically suspect that the patient is having a urotary colic, but if you do not get on the x-ray, so don't think you are wrong. You might be dealing with a patient who has a radiolucent stone. So these are the radiopaque stones, calcium oxalate, dihydrate, monohydrate, and phosphate stones. Poorly radiopaque is the phosphate or infective stones are poorly radiopaque. See, radiopacity depends on the amount of calcium. So if it is an infective stone with less amount of calcium, we'll have a poorly radiopaque stone. If it is a mainly calcium, a mixed calcium oxalate stone will have a radio opaque stone. But if it is a uric acid stone or ammonia muriate xanthine or indian ivy stone, it is radiolucent. This group comprises 20% of the all uh, uh, stones, 20%. Okay. Uh, but it has its importance. Uh, sometimes you will be you will find a radio opacity in the extra QB. So to Predict that this is a ureteric stone or a stone, you need to know what is the ureteric line. Ureteric line starts from the tip of the transverse process, goes down ground, then somewhat in front of the SI joint comes to the this point, and from this it takes a sharp bend downwards. So if you find something low down or more medial or more lateral, think of something else other than ureteric stone. So this is important where the ureter goes. Okay, and this is a very obvious picture showing a uh, stack on calculus. You cannot miss this on x ray. So, x ray has its important also. This is a bladder stone typically uh, seen in children with malnourishment. This is typical of a stone plain x ray of a nephrocalcinosis. This is something new. This patient has something here. This is a left renal cone, and this is a radiopaque shadow. We do not know from the x ray QB, it can be anything. So ultimately it turned out to be a stone in the anomalous kidney and come. So the most important and the gold standard of investigation in a patient who is suspected to have a ureteric or a renal stone is a CT. The, this is superior to IV because uh, you, you remember that if a patient comes with acute colic, what happens because of the obstruction? that kidney temporarily stops working. Okay, so if you do a, a eye view, what is the superior eye view over uh, the plain X-ray KB is because it delineates the PCS. So in acute condition, if the kidney is not secreting, what you will see, the opposite kidney is nicely delineated, but this kidney is not delineated. Don't think this patient is having a non-functioning kidney. This is secondary to acute obstruction. So what you are getting uh, more than a straight extra QB, nothing. So if the patient comes with acute ureteric colic, and if you find a radiopaque shadow in the line of ureter, and if you find a hydroteronephrosis in the left side, eye view is not the standard of care because in eye view, most likely you will find a non-opacified ipsilateral kidney. That is not going to help out. Okay, so that is the reason. We do a NCCT and that is a gold standard right now to rule, uh, to diagnose or rule out a ureteric stone. Okay, 
the NCCT can diagnose a past out sooner also. Suppose a patient has a history of typical of erotic colic. You do a CT scan, you, you, you do not see any uh, stone, but if you look clearly, you can see the residual hydrotronephrosis or there will be some edema and of the ureter with surrounding uh, stranding at the site of previous infection. So that will tell you, yes, this patient had a stone, now it is passed out. Another important thing is Hounsfield unit, that is the stone density. So that is very important in today's management because ultimately either I'll be doing a ESWL, I'll be doing a PCNL, I'll be doing a URSL, whatever I do, for PCNL, URSL is not needed, but if I am planning for uh, ESWL, the Hounsfield or stone density is very important because the stone density, most of the calcium oxalate stones, monohydrate, dihydrate, has a stone density of more than 1000 and uric acid stone has a density of less than 400. So if I do not see any stone in the X-ray, but find a stone in CT scan with a Hounsfield less than 400, I immediately suspect this patient is having a uric acid stone. And uric acid stone, sometimes we might subject the patient for a uh, medical expulsive therapy on this. But if I find a, a stone with more than 1000, I know this patient is having a hard stone, calcium oxalate stone. This machine is not amenable for ESW. This machine is not amenable for a potassium cyclic or medical expulsive therapy. So that is the uh, added advantage of doing a CT over IVU and X-ray. So there is a concern. Uh, so if I do CT, uh, much uh, frequently, so there is a concern that there is a chance of radiation to the patient. Yes, the concern is valid because if you see here, the, the radiation in X-ray KV is 0.7 millisievert. In NCCT KV, standard NCCT KV, which most of our machines has is 10 millisievert. So this is 13 or 14 times at least. So to, to, for this concern, the, the companies have come down with low dose CT where the radiation is 1.8 to 2.2 or ultra low CT where it is 0.5 to 1.7. This is less than the sex ray KV. And if you see the pictures here, you can see a stone here. This is a standard low dose. This is not a standard CT. This is a standard low dose CT with the radiation of 1.8 to 2.2. And this is an ultra low dose CT. You can see, yeah, the uh, opacification of the kidney is not that good, but my point of intention is to look for the stone. You can easily look for this stone. And the sensitivity is also good. Extra KV says is 40 to 77%. NCC is 90 to 100%. Even in ultra low dose CT, the sensitivity is 86 to 96%, especially more than 86%. So this ultra low dose CT is now the standard if you have it in your institute with a very good sensitivity and specificity with a very low radiation dose. Sometimes we need to do a contrast study also. Till now, I have talked about the non-contrast CT. Contrast, why it is needed? Because some patients, just like this patient who has a fever with increased TLC, with flank tenderness, I will suspect this patient might be having a infected hydrotonephrosis or renal abscess or pyelonephritis. Okay, these are three possibilities this patient has. So I need to have some investigations which can guide me to this. If I do a CT scan, I might find the signs of pyelonephritis, focal pyelonephritis. There might be signs of infected hydronephrosis. There may be signs of perinephric standings or erotic edema. All these things points out this patient is having active or infected hydronephrosis. That will change my management. So if I have, if I suspect infected pathology, it's better to do a contrast study instead of a non-contrast study if the patient's creatinine is normal. Uh, this is a picture of IV. You can see a stone blocking this. Uh, this is another shadow. This picture is not, but if you if you trace this species, you'll see this is not related to this. That is importance of IV. It can delineate the TCS. Another patient with a radiopaque shadow, you can see this is in line with the ureter. So this is a lower uteric stone. This is the same picture which I show you left renal calculus along with a radiopaque shadow. This was a CT and this is the eye view. Eye view showed a 
ectopic kidney in the pelvis with a stone in the pelvis. Okay, this is important. He was treated and post treatment digestant, you can see. See, another importance of contrast studies, I view. If you see a stone in UHG or an X ray KUV, you might think this is a renal stone. Yes, this is a renal stone. If you do IVV, this is a renal stone, but this is a diverticular stone. This is the calyx, you can see, and this is outside the calyxial system. This is a diverticular stone. The whole management changes. So with diverticular stone, it's very difficult to do a PCNL, but ultimately that is the treatment, but you have to be prepared before. And you cannot give ESW to patient. Suppose this patient has a Hounsfield unit of 300. Even then, you cannot give this patient. You have to do a PCNL. For this, you need to have a contrast. Same here, if you do an X-ray or plain CT, you might think this patient is having multiple renal stones. Look here, these multiple renal stones, and the, these are basically medullary calcifications, which toothbrush appearance is typical of medullary spons kidney or nephrocalcinosis. Unless you do a contrast study, you cannot do, you cannot do this. So these are the investigations in emergency or routine. These are the investigations and by this time, you must be sure what is the pathology here. In emergency patients, all patients should have an urine analysis to rule out or confirm any UTI. You need to do a urea creatinine because sometimes in acute erotic colic, the creatinine might rise, even if the opposite kidney is normal, the creatinine might rise severely if the opposite kidney is abnormal. You need to do uric acid, you need to do calcium, sodium, potassium, you need to rule out infection, CRP. And if you're planning for an intervention, you have to do a coagulation profile in the form of PT, APTK, INR, PTCT, everything, just like any other patient. So what is the optimum treatment when to admit a patient? A patient come to emergency. First thing, you need to take a history whether the patient has an adequate urine output or not. If the patient has adequate urine output, you can rule out that the patient is having bilateral kidney disease or significant bilateral kidney disease. The first thing. Second is whether the patient has any febrile episode. What is the vitals of the patient? Tachycardia or hypotension? And if there is any clinical telltale sign of infection like flank tenderness or flank mass. So if any of this is there and you suspect any pathology, infective pathology, you have to admit the patient. If not, you need to know what is the duration of pain, what is the severity of pain. One day duration or few hours duration, mild pain, this can be treated in emergency with the best drug of choice is diclofenac, okay, or endomethacin or ibuprofen. We normally give diclofenac. So there is a concern that diclofenac being an NSAID, it might cause a decrease in renal function. No, if the opposite kidney is normal, you can safely give diclofenac. It does not reduce the GFR of the patient. But before giving diclofenac, at least repeating it, you need to know what is the creatinine of the patients. If you cannot give diclofenac, the second drug of choice is either pentajosin and tramadol. Okay. So, so there are two categories. One patient, one group of patients will be relieved and discharge the patient from emergency on NSAIDs. And other group will cannot be discharged because the symptom is not relieved. You need to admit these patients. And if you discharge the patients to home, don't forget to put the patients to alpha blocker because alpha blockers uh, improve the stone clearance at the same time. It has a role to reduce recurrent colic also. So if the analgesia cannot be achieved medically, you need to admit the patient and think why the patient is not being relieved with analgesia. Uh, if you suspect sepsis, this is an emergency, urological emergency, you need to decompress the kidney either by form of PCN or uh, urgent digestanting. Okay. In no patient with infected system or suspected infected system, you should do definitive therapy right then. You should divert the system, control the, control the sepsis and treat the patient once the sepsis is fully controlled. Okay. Now, uh, the question comes for the stone removal. So what are the options? Options are observation, very few uh, selective group of patients, 
Second option is medical expulsive therapy, uh, we call it a MET. And third option is active stone removal. So how do you decide who are the patients who can be treated conservatively? If a patient is a small renal stone or non-obstructive urinary stone, who has a well-controlled pain with analgesia alone, who does not have any clinical evidence of sepsis, and on biochemical evaluation, you find a normal functional reserve. These are the patients who can be put on conservative therapy. If any of this does not fit, you have to treat the patient. Okay. The second group is medical expulsive therapy. Yes, this patient does not have any sepsis, who do not uh, have any obstructed system. There is no emergency and they opt for a conservative therapy with medication. This is different from only conservative therapy. Okay. So this patient should have adequate uh, water intake so that the urine output is more than two liters. So depending on his or her physical activity, you ask the patient to take water is maybe three liters, 3.5 liters, 2.5 liters, but the urine output should be two liters and the specific gravity if you uh, want to do it properly, it should be less than 1.10. Alpha blockers are recommended for uteric stone. The options are either you can give tamsulosine, psilodocin. How does it work? Basically, tamsulosine and psilodocin uh, relaxes the uretic smooth muscle. So it creates a greater passage, a wider passage for the stone expulsion. So it has been seen between the two groups, whom, in, whom you put on alpha blockers versus whom are not, who are not on alpha blockers, the patients who are on alpha blockers has a less episode of recurrent erotic colic, increased uh, percentage of stone expulsion and early stone expansion. So less pain, early stone expansion and increased stone expansion. So that way alpha blockers helps. Tamsulosin, serodocin, either way you can give is there a role of steroids? Some paper shows if the patient has a lower uteric stone, yes, but some paper shows no. So that is uh, still a controversial issue. You can give the patient is not diabetic or is there no contraindications for uh, steroid uh, administration. And if you put the patient on medical expulsive therapy, patient should be followed to monitor stone position and you look for any uh, new hydronephrosis or increasing hydronephrosis or development in any new symptoms or development in a sepsis. Uh, in that case, you have to intervene early. So who are the patients uh, you can put on MET? If the patient has a urethral stone less than 10 millimeter without any obvious indication for urgent operation, these are the patients. The maximum duration the patient's can be on this MET is 30 days, 40 days, but we call it 30 days. Even this, if the stone does not pass out in 30 days, he or she should be subjected for operation. So what are the indications for active removal of stones? The stones with a low likelihood spontaneous passage. Uh, see, if you diagnose a, diagnose a patient with a bigger stone lower down, versus a patient with a small, uh, sorry, if you have a patient who has an upper uteric stone versus a patient who has a lower uteric stone, chances of spontaneous expulsion is more in a patient with lower uteric stone. If you find a patient with a 12 millimeter stone versus a six millimeter stone, chances of spontaneous passage is more in a patient with a smaller stone. Okay, the patient who has persistent pain is more obstructed. The patient who has a persistent obstruction is definitely obstructed. So if, uh, the patient who has renal insufficiency, either because of the stone episode or he has a, a previous renal insufficiency because of any medical renal disease or recurrent stone disease. So these are the patients who should be subjected for early operations. They should not be put for medical expulsive therapy. Sometimes the patient uh, insists that I do not want any surgery. So explain them clearly what are the uh, implications of non-getting operative implications of sepsis, implications of persistent obstruction. Okay, so this was the erotral stone. So this is somewhat different for kidney stones. Who are the patients 
with kidney stones so need to be uh, treated early stones more than 15 mm no question you should remove this or if the patient has a small stone maybe 10 mm and the patient does not agree for surgery and then follow up you see the stone is growing that is stones in high risk patients i'll come over the high risk group if there is an obstruction by stone pure stone causing hydronephrosis if there is a, a single episode of infection in a renal stone even if it's 1 cm you need to take it out if the patient is symptomatic or special situations profession like a pilot if a pilot has a 5 mm renal stone that is an indication for surgery in a woman who is considering pregnancy before pregnancy try to always remove the stone whether it is a 5 mm stone or 3 cm stone okay these are not the group who can be put on medical therapy or observation before any intervention in urinary tract you must have a urine microscopy to rule out uh, uti and if it is there you have to treat this before uh, intervention anticoagulation therapy if the patient is on anticoagulation therapy it's better to stop it after consulting with the cardiologist but yes sometimes it cannot be stopped in those cases any form of laser surgery is better almium laser or thulium laser you should use this because this causes minimal post operative hematuria it is if it is absolutely necessary yes you can do the surgery with anticoagulation on but try to use a laser energy so once you have decided yes this patient needs a stone for stone surgery for the kidney so how to decide which patient needs what see uh, our goal of treatment or any any treatment goal is maximum relief with minimum morbidity and you to know what are the armamentarium you have for for which uh, with which you can treat the stones we have the options of swl dsl extra corporeal shock lithotripsy pcnl that is percutaneous nephrolithotomy urs is ureteral rhinoscopic l or this l lithotripsy next we has laparoscopic stone surgery and open surgery open surgery yes when we are students like you we i uh, should see all open surgery is very rarely we could see any uh, endo urology but the now it has gone to the fifth position because of the advancements uh, this is uh, extra corporeal shock wave lithotripsy what happens there is an energy source okay either it can be electromagnetic or electrohydraulic this energy so this is an electromagnetic electromagnetic electrohydraulic or piezoelectric or ultrasonic so this will generate a shock wave will be focused in another point that is called the f2 and the patient's kidney and the stone specifically the stone is focused on that f2 so this shock wave breaks the stone there is various mechanism depending on this whether it is electromagnetic or electro uh, hydraulic or piezoelectric the basic but the ultimate effects are there are shock waves With which causes multiple cracks or bubbles inside the stones. Ultimately, these cracks increases coalesce, and the bubbles increases coalesce, and leading to stone fragmentation. So, what this ESWL does, ESWL causes multiple fragments of the stone. Okay. So this is a picture. This is uh, basically C arm. This is the shock head. You can see here the patient is lying here. and you need to localize the stone either you can use a fluoroscopy or some machines most of the machines nowadays have a ultrasound which localizes you can see the ultrasound here it localizes the stone and after that the shock it gives shocks there is a small video uh, yes this is how it is done uh, this is the shock head this is the stone here and i need to localize the stone here they have shown with the x there is a pointer you can the pointer you focus the stone just at the f2 of the shock heads okay and uh, what happens with the shock heads the stones are fragmented so you can uh, imagine that if a stone is very hard on field is more than 1000 the chances of a stone breakage is less 
so now it is a uh, in, uh, indication of the guidelines is if a patient has a stone density more than 1000 do not subject the patient for socket blepharotripsy try other methods okay so the factors affecting outcomes are the as i was saying the stone composition stone attenuation or hornsfield is more than 1000 do not give extracorporeal lithotripsy and if you know other stone is having a cysteine brushite calcium oxalate monohydrate or matrix stone sometimes we have recurrent stone formers um, we have the history of previous stone analysis so we know the this patient how many times the patient forms a stone most of the cases will be the repetition of the same stone so if you know the composition and the patient has a cysteine brush at this kind of stones or a stone attenuation more than 1000 unit no if the patient is skin to stone, stone distance more than 10 cm in case of morbid obesity because you need to focus the stone at the f2 of the shock head okay so most of the companies have a distance of 8 to 9 cm or 7 to 10 cm max so if the skin to stone distance more than 10 cm do not do that is another advantage of ct i forgot to tell you in ct you can you, you can determine the what is the distance between the skin to stone renal anatomic anomalies the patient has horseshoe kidney calicial diverticulum yes the eswl can break the stone but in horseshoe kidney or calicial diverticulum so it will get fragmented but it will not come up so the ultimate purpose is now sub so anomalies do not put the subject for eswl unfavorable lower pool anatomy alchemy and relative or complete patient immobility the patient has to be mobile to pass the stones so bedridden patients no eswl so this was another thing. Suppose you have a lower polar calcial stone here, one centimeter. So you can break the stones with ESW, but after the fragmentation, stone has to go up and come down. So if you have a narrow infundibulum, if you have a long infundibulum, or if you have a very acute angle, you can fragment, you cannot pass the stone. So, so before subjecting the patient for ESW for lower calcial stone, you need to have this. What is the infundibular pelvic angle? It should not be acute. This should not be more than five mill, less than five millimeter, and this should not be more than one centimeter. So, if you have any of the factors or combination of the factors, do not subject the patient for ESW. It is very important for lower polar collateral anatomy, not for this and this. You can fragment the stone and come out. Contraindications, pregnancies and absolute contraindications will harm the fetus. Uncorrected coagulability. No, I have seen patients having nephrectomy after uh, giving ESWL with coagulopathy. So that is very, very important. Untreated urinary infection. I have seen patient going to ventilation after ESWL with active UTI. Okay. Arterial aneurysm, neostone. No, it might cause rupture. Either aortic aneurysm or renal aneurysm, it will cause rupture of the aneurysm. So it's an absolute contraindication. Lower down obstruction, you cannot, you should not do because you can uh, fragment the stones. But if you you have fragmented the stone in the pelvis and there is a lower down obstruction in the ureter, so what will happen? All these stones will break and come to the ureter, leading to a misery of the patient and you also. And if you cannot target the stone because of skeletal memory, severe kyphoscoliosis. Patient cannot lie down. Okay. It's a contraindication. So, next modality we have is the percutaneous nephrolithotomy. As you can see from the picture, percutaneous from the skin, nephrolithotomy, you're making a hole in the kidney and uh, going to the kidney. Small video demonstration again. Uh, yes. So, what we do is we put a erotic catheter to the kidney. Put a contrast and see the system. Okay, this is an x ray. You can see the x ray. Now I have to make a passage from the surface, the passage through the fornix to the kidney. So this is the needle making the passage, put a guide where I have to. This is just a cell dingent technique, just like cell dingent technique. So you do a serial dilatation and put an ampler sheath, which creates an access to the kidney. This is an access to the kidney. After that, it is very easy. Uh, you can either break the stone with a laser energy or a pneumatic lithotripter and clear this. The advantage of PCNL is it does not depend on the size of the stone. If you have a 7 centimeter, 
even then you can do you might need to do a multiple punctures even you have a stone with a horn spill unit of 2000 unit even then you can do it you might need a laser okay if any you have a diverticular stone you can do this okay that is the advantage of pcnl the next option we have is a ureter rhinoscopy or ursl this is a no hole surgery even in pcnl you have to make a hole here in urs you don't make any hole here you go to the natural orifice that is the urethra the stone can either be in the urethra or in the kidney so the procedure is same only your instrument changes if it is in the ureter you use a rigid or semi rigid ureteroscope if it is in the kidney or calicial stone you need to have a flexible urs that is the thing small video uh yes the initial procedure is same up put a ureteric catheter down down to the kidney then you over a guide wire uh you do a rgp over a guide wire you put an access sheet through which you will put a uh, uh, either a uh, normal semi rigid or a flexible ureteroscope okay this is the access sheet to which we go the advantage is there is no hole in the kidney so even in the safest hand pcnl has a complication rate of 15 to 20% or 10 to 15% rate of blood transfusion 1% rate of angioembolization because of persistent hematuria and less than 1% rate of nephrectomy because of persistent hematuria which is not there in case of urs because you are not making any hole in the kidney but the disadvantage is uh you have to have a normal size or good caliber ureter that is the first disadvantage 10% patients we cannot enter in the first time you have to stand the patient and come out after maybe or one or two weeks time you need to have a laser without laser you cannot laser these stones and sometimes in inferior calicial stones it is difficult to reach here so the only option there is you have to do a pcnl okay so there is advantage or disadvantage of urs also and if you have a very big stone this is not amenable for rirs or urs uh, so how do you decide uh, what is the best option for this stone there are some stone related factors there is some renal anatomic factors and there is some clinical factors stone related factors size number location composition come to this so first we see it is a lower calicial stone or non lower calicial stone it is a non lower calicial stone more than 2 cm no confusion go for a pcnl if it is less than 2 cm less than 1 cm hwl if the hornsfield unit is less than 1000 if it is more than 1000 do not subject the patient for hw go for ursl 1 to 2 cm this group dense stone cystine stone no hw go for ureteroscopy and the ultimate is pcnl if hw fails if ureteroscopy fails pcnl the rule of thumb is more than 2 cm pcnl less than 2 cm if it is less than 1 cm soft stone hw 1 to 2 cm or hard stone go for ureteroscopy if anything fails go for pcnl so bigger stones pcnl very small stone soft stone hw medium stone you go for rirs this is different for lower calicial stones lower calicial this is even more smaller less than 1 cm less than 1000 hw uh and he has to have a favorable anatomy this is new what i what i told before infernopelvic angle so all these things only patients less than 1000 small stones several anatomy small group having hw other even less than 1 cm goes for ureteroscopy 1 to 2 cm ureteroscopy if you cannot do pcnl okay next factor is determines so this is regarding the site a uh, type of stone the next factor is before surgery you need to uh, rule out some other factors when the patient has pugio when the patient has a horseshoe kidney this is a patient with pugio renal stones normally if the patient does not have renal stone what would be done pcnl but here you cannot do a pcnl because you can do the remove the stones but it will be there 
So the option is either you can go for an open pyeloplasty and pyelodysotomy or laparoscopic pyeloplasty or pyelodysotomy, or you can do a PCNL with an endopyelotomy for these fusion obstructions, or you can stage it. You can do a PCNL first and second stage, you can do a lap pyeloplasty. So you cannot miss this. If you miss this and only do the stone removal, the patient will come back again after two years with multiple stones. So you need to look for this, any distal obstruction. Horseshoe kidney, small stone one centimeter, even then you should not subject the patient for ESWL. Normally, normal kidney, I can give ESWL, not here because the stone will fragment, but it cannot come out because of this anatomical abnormality. Here the option is you have to do a PCNL, okay, or RIRS. Here, uh, calicial diverticular stone, you have no options, but you have to do a PCNN only. Do not subject this patient for ESW even for smaller stones. This patient, pelvic kidney, pelvic kidney uh, is very difficult to do a normal PCNL. So what you used to do is you have to do a laparoscopic assisted PCNL. You remove the colon and under vision, you do the puncture and do a PCNL, this lab guided PCNL. So all these anatomical abnormalities you need to keep in your mind. Erotetic stones are relatively easy. So you need to stone related factors, clinical factors, technical. Clinical factors is symptom severity, associated infection and solitary kidney. In solitary kidney, there is no role of MET because the patients might come with anuria, acute renal failure. So this is a must. Solitary kidney, no MET, no conservative treatment. You have to intervene. Okay. Infective state, you have to intervene. Otherwise, if nothing is there, so you have to decide based on the location, size, composition, degree. Upper uteric stone, small stone, SWL or URS. So here options are either USWL or URS. Small stones, uh, less dense stones, SWL, bigger stones, lower down stones, go for URS. Upper stones, SWL, bigger stones or lower down stones, go for URS. Okay. Sometimes what happens is because there is some uh, anatomical abnormality lower down, we need to do uh, antidote URS also. What if if I found a residual stones even after treatment? So we need to do a, either USG, CT, and depending on the size of the residual stones, you have to treat the patient either by SWL or by uh, RIRS, anything else. Bladder stone or urethral stone, this is a patient with bladder stones, pediatric patient. Always investigate why this patient has formed a bladder stones. Adult patient, if comes with a bladder stone, think that whether this patient is a migrated stone, patient has a stone in the kidney and comes out of the bladder, or this is a stone which has formed in the bladder because the management changes. This is a patient with prostatic urethral calculus, you push it down to the bladder and do a systolithotripsy. The question comes if an adult patient more than 50 years with voiding LUTS comes with a bladder stone, whether you should do with a bladder stone only or you need to do something else. Yes, if the patient is obstructed, if the patient has prostatomegaly, if the patient has obstruction of the uroflow metry, you need to do the distal obstruction clearance in the form of PURP or BNI along with the systolithotopsy. Otherwise, the patient will be uh, prone for more stone formation in the future. So for bladder stone, always look out, search for the cause, what caused the bladder stone. Laparoscopic open surgery, very rarely done done only in patients with a non-functional kidney because of stones. You need to do a nephrectomy. Or patient has a PUG obstruction simultaneously. You do a pyeloplasty and pyelodysotomy. Or the patient has a big erotetic stone or a erotetic stricture. You need to tackle the stone and the stricture simultaneously. Or the patient has a lower erotetic stone which needs an, a reimplantation. So these are the indications when you either go for open surgery or a laparoscopic surgery. Okay. Now, come to the metabolic evaluation and recurrence that is very important. You need to know who are the patients in, you have to go for an extensive evaluation, who are the patients you need to go for a basic me metabolic evaluation. So I need to know who are the high-risk group for stone formation. So any patient who is a recurrent stone former is a high-risk patient. Strong family history, patient has an intestinal stone disease like this patient, patient has pathologic skeletal fractures, history of recurrent UTI, personal history of gout, solitary kidney, anatomic abnormalities, CKD patients, or stones complex of system. So if you find any of this in a patient of stone disease, he falls into high-risk group category. Okay. So any patient 
even this first time stone former who does not give any history of this you have to take history of underlying predisposing condition which i discussed what are the medications which he is what are the dietary excess is he taking too much of animal proteins non dairy milk proteins and you have to do this blood screen sodium potassium calcium uh, you have to do uh, abg intact parathyroid hormone is a must even in a patient who is a single stone former okay urine analysis radiography and stone analysis is a must in all patients so the earlier methods of stone analysis is not done now either you have to do a x ray diffraction or f ray infrared spectroscopy many times we find a stone with composite um stone this patient has uric acid calcium oxalate monohydrate apatite stone so this is important because if you have a stone analysis many patients will not need a extensive metabolic evaluation because in, you 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 know what can be the cause so stone analysis known you do a basic evaluation stone is unknown you have to do a extensive metabolic evaluation and if the patient is low risk general preventive measures if the patient is a high risk stone former you have to do a specific metabolic evaluation and you need to take specific recurrence prevention what are the specific meta metabolic evaluation so the question is when it should be done the patient having a stone do not do any metabolic work up then you first clear the patient of stone wait for at least 3 weeks 3 months is best suggested and after that you do a metabolic evaluation what is there among with the basic test you need to do a 24 hour urine sample analysis for this calcium magnesium sodium potassium oxalate citrate uric acid cysteine this is not needed in a patient who is a low risk category patient and with this more than 50% patients will come to a diagnosis so what is the exact pathology preventive measures some is general some is stone specific generally is fluid intake 2.5 diuresis neutral ph beverage specific gravity less than 1.1 that should be balanced vegetable and fibers calcium yes some people have the uh, misconception that if if i have a stone uh, if i am a recurrent stone former i should cut down my calcium no if you cut down the calcium it will lead to more oxalate absorption leading to ox calcium oxalate stones so the ideal is the patient should have a 1 to 1.2 grams per day calcium supplements you should not take more you should not take less there is no rule of calcium restriction avoid large portions of food stuffs rich in oxalate this is of this you should not take too much of dairy proteins animal protein should be 0.8 to 1 gram per kg per day so this is the normal dietary advice lifestyle reduce your weight adequate physical activity do not do excessive fluid loss stone specific uh, i don't think there is any time right now i skip skip all these things so yes this is a summary so if a patient has stone episode you look is in a previous episode no so this patient after treatment goes for a normal dietary protocol less sodium less milk increase in output if the patient is a recurrent stone former or the bowel disease gout diabetes some medications family history these are high risk groups this patient goes a uh, 24 urine studies along with serum studies first time stone former does not need any 24 urine studies okay so after doing this you you will be able to know wh what is the composition of the stone what is the biochemical abnormality patient is having okay uncomplicated calcium stone disease will have either hypercalciuria normal calciuria hypercalciuria need to treat with thiazides normal calciuria nothing potassium citrate okay if you have some other stone disease this is needs a specific treatment hyperuricemia allopurinol uric acid stone one thing i would like to say this uric acid stone does not mean the patient is having a hyperuricemia most of the patients 80% patients will have normal uric acid level the basic pathology is low ph of the urine so in low ph of the urine there is increased nucleation leading to a uric acid stone so in these patients i do not need this patient to treat allopurinol so 
these patients will be better off with the potassium citrate to increase the urine ph around 6 to 6.5 okay if there is a relapse then you should use allopurinol there is a notion that any uric acid stones will need allopurinol no if the patient is an hyper uricemia only then they will be put on allopurinol otherwise just take care of the urinary ph cystinuria yes this is terrific infection stones uh, you need to know what, why there is infection clear the stones and these patients need to be on long term antibiotics sometimes you put the patients on antibiotics for 2 to 3 months even then if it occurs there is a role of acetic hexamine acid so this is our index patient how is it treated this patient has pain fever signs of sepsis so he was admitted managed conservatively the nsaids and antibiotics this patient showed one sided inferior calicial stone and other sided hydrotronephrosis so to know what was the cause in emergency a ct was done which showed a uh, right lower calicial erotic calculus that was the uh, reason for hydrotronephrosis or mist on usg and there is some sign of infection and there was the opposite sided lower calicial 15 mm calculus with a horn field of 1133 so this helped in our management see first there were signs of infection we could diagnose the erotic stone with ct that comes in the protocol of investigation we could know what is the size 15 mm what is the stone lower calicial stone and what is the horn field 1133 so all these dictated the management the ct findings since there was signs of infection in ct and clinically the patient was stented on the erotic stone site infection was control he was for, uh, uh, he underwent ursl on that site for the erotic stone followed by after one month flexible ursl on the uh, opposite side because this patient has a hard stone we did not subject the patient hard stone 15 mm stone lower calicial stone it the subject the patient for esw we stayed away for a rirs of flexible urs this patient is a diabetic recurrent stone former and is a history of uh, chronic diarrhea so we did a uh, extensive metabolic evaluation in the form of 24 hour urine um, um, parameters and which revealed a hyperoxaluria here is a calcium oxalate stone so he is for evaluation in gastroenterology for chronic diarrhea and recurrence prevention who is on fluid therapy calcium supplementation and potassium citrate so uh, uh, so this should be the way in which you you treat a patient who comes to the emergency or your opd with a suspected uh, urological stone so uh, this yeah. is the end so any yes, any questions yes. Uh, yes thank you dr sarkar for a very uh, good elaborative lecture on management of uh, renal stone i think all that part has been covered and uh, there is no difficulty in answering uh, even in practical or in theory regarding the management of renal stones. I don't find anything in the chat box, but you have given a complete uh, outline of management, including nice video clips of the uh, procedures. So as there is no question in the chat box, I think uh, there is no question. Uh, very good coverage. Thank you. Thank sir, you very yes, much. Sir. I, I thank you and ASI has given me this opportunity because it's always a pleasure for me uh, to uh, be with the students. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you, GMB sir, students you. did not have a, a such academic uh, program. So all the GMB students are present uh, now and also they view the lectures in the uh, lizard time. These all are kept in our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Million, they can conclude. Thank you, sir. Thank you.